Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to continue our chapter on the immune system. In the previous video, we covered the first two objectives. In this video, we're going to cover the last two objectives. The third objective, and the one that we're going to start off with here, is all about the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system can identify specific invaders and then mount an attack against that pathogen. The response is going to be variable and it really depends on the identity of the pathogen. The adaptive immune system as a whole can be divided though into two divisions, the humoral immunity and the cell mediated immunity. Each involves the identification of first the specific pathogen and then the organization of an appropriate immune response. Now, we're going to cover a couple of things here about the adaptive immune system. And we're first going to start by talking about the cells of the immune system. The adaptive immune system actually consists of two types of lymphocytes. These are the B cells and the T cells. The B cells govern the humoral response while the T cells mount the, mediated, the cell mediated response. All cells of the immune system are created in the bone marrow, right? We covered this in our first objective. But B and T cells, they're going to mature in different locations. The B cells mature in the bone marrow, all right? And the T cells, they mature in the thymus. Now, when we're exposed to a pathogen, all right, what happens? Well, it first may take a few days for the physical symptoms to be relie relieved, all right? This occurs because the adaptive immune response is going to take time to form specific defenses against the pathogen, all right? And we really want to understand what this entails. And so now we want to cover the humoral immunity and the cell-mediated immunity so that we can fully understand what this means, all right? Let's first start talking about the humoral immunity. This is centered on antibody production by plasma cells, which are activated B cells. All right. Again, remember, when you're exposed to a pathogen, it may take a few days all right, for the physical symptoms to be felt and to be relieved. And this occurs because, again, the adaptive immune response takes time. All right, obviously targeted responses don't happen overnight. It may take up to a week for it to be fully operational. And you might be asking, well, why? Well, the antibodies being produced need to be tailored to recognize specific antigens that are present on the invading microbe. The cells responsible for this incredible feat are the B cells, which are a type of lymphocytes that mature in our bone marrow and become activated in places like our spleen and lymph nodes. All right. Now that's a new word, antibodies. What does that mean? Well, antibodies, also known as immunoglobulins, these are Y-shaped molecules that they have remarkable structure and function. Their form comprises two identical heavy chains, all right, two identical heavy chains and two light chains that are held together by disulfate linkages and non-covalent interactions. Now, at the tip of the Y is what we call a variable region. All right, at the tip of the Y is what we call a variable region. Within this region, there are unique sequences that can identify and then bind to a particular antigenic sequence, very much like a lock and key mechanism. And it's this specificity that makes antibodies very effective. All right, here's the thing though. Getting to this point involves a meticulous process called hypermutation, where each B cell Adapt, adapts its antigen binding region to find the best match for the invader. The survivors of this rigorous process are going to have the highest affinity for the antigen and are then selected for. All right, this is a mechanism known as clonal selection. Now, what happens once these antibodies bind to their specific antigens? Well, in the case of freely circulating antibodies, there are several outcomes that are possible. All right. You can have opsonization. The antibodies, once bound to the antigen, flag the invaders for other white cells to consume. All right. So that's one thing that can happen, opsonization. 
All right. So for antibodies secreted into body fluids, there are three main possibilities. First, once bound to a specific antigen, antibodies might may attack other leukocytes to phagocytize these antigens immediately. This is called opinization. All right. Second, they can cause the invaders to clump together, making them easier to neutralize. So antibodies may cause pathogens to clump together or ag uh, agulita uh, agglutinate, forming large insoluble complexes that can be phagocytized. This is called agglutination. All right. Third, you can have neutralization happen. They can occur, they can directly block a pathogen from invading tissue. So antibodies can block the ability of a pathogen to invade tissue, essentially neutralizing it. So for cell surface antibodies, the binding of antigen to a B cell causes activation of that cell, resulting in its proliferation and formation of plasma and memory cells. Now it's important and crucial it's important and crucial to appreciate that not all antibodies are created equal. We can categorize them into five isotypes. IgM, all right? So um, remember that antibodies are also known as immunoglobulins that can be um, shortened as Ig, and there's five isotypes. There's IgM, there's IgD, there's IgB, there's IgE, and then there's IgA, all right? Each serve a distinct purpose, of course, depending on the phase of the immune response, the type of pathogen, and its location in the body. Remarkably, cell can, uh, cells can switch between these isotopes when influenced by specific cytokines, and this is a process that's termed isotope switching. Now, lastly, on um, a note on the longevity of, of the response, not all B cells are, per, are in perpetual action. Some can remain dormant until they encounter their specific antigen. Upon this encounter, they can divide to form plasma cells, which produce copious amounts of antibodies and memory B cells, which are guardians of our past inf uh, infections. Should we ever face the same invader again, these memory cells ensure our response is quicker and more potent. All right, and this is kind of the cornerstone of the effectiveness of being vaccinated, all right, vaccinations. So in summary here, humoral immunity is not just about defense, it's about memory, adaptation, and precision. It's an evolutionary marvel that allows us to face a myriad of pathogens and hopefully, most of the time, emerge resilient. All right, now, whereas humoral immunity is based on the activity of B cells, all right, Cell-mediated um, immunity involves T cells. So that's what we want to cover next. T cells, they mature in the thymus where they undergo both positive and negative selection. So let's define what that means, positive and negative selection. Positive selection refers to the maturing um, only cells that can respond to the presentation of antigen on MHC. All right. So these are um, cells that cannot respond to MHC undergo apoptosis, and the ones that can are the ones that survive and mature. All right, so positive selection refers to um, the maturing only, uh, uh, maturing only of cells that can respond to the presentation of an antigen on a major histocompatibility complex. The cells that cannot respond to MHC they're going to undergo apoptosis, cell death, because they will not be able to respond um, in the periphery. Negative selection refers to causing apoptosis in cells that are self-reactive. What that means is they're activated by proteins produced by the organism itself. The maturation of T cells is facilitated by thymo, uh, thymosin, which is a peptide hormone secreted by thymic cells. Once the T cells have left the thymus, it is mature but naive. But exposure to antigen T cells will undergo colonial selection so that only those with the highest affinity for a given antigen will proliferate. All right, 
So positive selection, you're only selecting for T cells that can react to antigen, antigens that are presented on MHC. And negative selection causes apoptosis in cell reactive T cells. And like we said, the peptide hormone thymosin promotes T cell development. Now, there are three major types of T cells. There's helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and suppressor T cells. All right, so we're going to cover what each one of these does. Starting with helper T cells, also called CD4 plus T cells, they coordinate the immune response by secreting chemicals known as lymphokines. These molecules are capable of recruiting other immune cells, all right, like plasma cells, uh, cytotoxic T cells, and macrophages, and increasing their activity. All right, so they recruit other immune cells and then they increase their activity. The loss of these cells, um, as occurs in human immunodeficiency virus, HIV infection, it's going to prevent the immune system from mounting an adequate response to infection. So these helper uh, T cells are very important in mounting an adequate response to infection. All right. Now, there are two types of helper T cells. You have Th1 cells and Th2 cells. All right. So, um, Th1 cells uh, secrete interferon gamma, which activates macrophages, and th Th2 cells, they activate B cells, primarily in parasitic infections. All right, so that's helper T cells. What about cytotoxic T cells? All right, for cytotoxic T cells, also called CD8 plus T cells, they're capable of directly killing virally infected cells by injecting toxic chemicals that promote apoptosis into the infected cell. So they inject these toxic chemicals and it promotes apoptosis, which is cell death, all right, in that infected cell. Now, CD8 plus TH cells, T cells, are they respond to antigen presented on MHC1 molecules. Because MHC1 presents endogenous antigens, CD8 plus T cells are most effective against viral and intracellular bacterial or fungal infections. All right, and our last class are suppressor or regulatory T cells. They're also they also expressed as CD4. They can um, differentiate. They can be differentiated from helper T cells because they express a protein called FOXP3. These cells help to do tone down the immune response once infection has been adequately contained. These cells also turn off self-reactive lymphocytes to prevent autoimmune diseases. This is termed self-tolerance. All right, so we said self-mediated immunity is centered on the function of T-cells, and we said that there are three types of T-cells. Helper T-cells, also known as CD4+, plus, they respond to antigens on MHC2, and they coordinate the rest of the immune system, secreting lymphokines to activate various arms of the immune defense. All right. Then we said there's cytotoxic T-cells. They respond to antigens on MHC1, and they kill virally infected cells. All right. Suppressor T cells, they tone down the immune response after an infection and promote self tolerance. Now, memory T cells, all right, there's also memory T cells, they serve a very similar function to memory B cells. All right, now let's elaborate on that, okay? And we can start now to talk about other functions and, and more details about the adaptive immune system. We can now talk about activation of the immune system, recognition of self and non-self, and we can even start to talk about immune, uh, uh, immunization, right? We said that memory T cells can also be generated. They're very similar to memory B cells. These cells lie in wait until the next exposure to the same antigen, and when, inf when activated, they result in a more robust and rapid response, all right? And this is, I think, a good segue into talking about the activation of the adaptive immune system. When the human body encounters an antigen, 
the immune system must be able to respond. All right. And it's important to note that the innate and the adaptive immune system, they're not separate entities. They function as a unit. All right. The proper functioning of the immune system depends on the interaction between the innate and the adaptive immune system. Now, there are five types of infectious pathogens. These are bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, and prions. All right, and the immune system's response depends really on the, spe the specific identity of the pathogen. All right, so it's important first to identify what is 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 the invader, right? Is it a bacteria? Is it a virus, fungi, parasites? If it's a prion, well, there's no immune defense, and prions are pretty complicated, so we're not going to get into that in this chapter. But for it's important for the system to identify what is invading, what is infecting the body, and then so that they can respond based off of the specific identity of the pathogen. All right. So that is the way that we want to think about the activation of the immune system. Now, another important component of the adaptive, uh, of just the immune system in general, really, um, but the adaptive immune system as well, is this recognition of self and non-self. So self antigens are proteins and carbohydrates that are present on the surface of every cell of the body. And under normal circumstances, these self antigens, they signal to immune cells that the cell is not threatening and should not be attacked. But when the immune system fails to make the distinction between self and foreign, it might attack cells that are expressing particular self antigens. All right. And so now you're body is attacking itself and this is a condition known as autoimmunity. Note that autoimmunity is only one potential problem with immune functioning, with, with, with immune malfunctioning, I should say. Another problem arises when the immune system misidentifies a foreign antigen as dangerous when in fact it isn't. Things like pollen and peanuts are not inherently threatening to human life, yet some people's immune uh, systems are hypersensitive to these antigens and they can become over activated when these antigens are encountered all right and this is what's called an allergic reaction allergies and autoimmunity are part of a family of immunity reactions that are classified as hypersensitivity reactions now one of the important things that have happened to to humankind is the invention of the vaccine. All right, and this leads us into talking about immunization and how important that is. Immunization, it can be achieved in an active or passive fashion. In active immunity, the immunity system is stimulated to produce antibodies against a specific pathogen. The means by which we are exposed to this pathogen may be either natural or artificial. Through natural exposure, antibodies are generated by B cells once an individual becomes infected. In artificial exposure, so through vaccines, this also results in the production of antibodies. However, the individual never experiences true infection. Instead, he or she receives an injection or um, a spray containing an antigen that will activate B cells to produce antibodies to fight that specific infection. The antigen may be weakened or killed. It may be a weakened or, you know, a dead or killed form of the microbe, or it may be just a part of the microbe's protein structure. It's introduced, and that way you get um, exposure to it, and then your body is able to produce antibodies for that, um, from that exposure so that if you were to be exposed again, the body would know what to do. All right. Now, immunization can also be achieved passively. So passive immunity results from the transfer of antibodies to an in in indiv individual. So the immunity is transient because only the antibodies, not the plasma cells that produce them, are given to the individual. Natural examples are the transfer of antibodies across the placenta during pregnancy so that you can protect the fetus and the transfer of antibodies from mother to her nursing infant through breast milk. 
All right. With that, we have covered objective three. And now we can move into our last and final objective, which is about the lymphatic system. All right. Here we're going to talk about the structure and function of the lymphatic system. Now, the immune system and the lymphatic system are very intimately related. B cells proliferate and develop within the lymphatic system, especially the lymph nodes. This system also serves other necessary and important functions for the body. Now, the lymphatic system, along with the cardiovascular system, is a type of circulatory system. It's made of one-way vessels that become larger as they move towards the center of the body. These vessels, they carry lymphatic fluid, lymph, and join to comprise a large thoracic duct in the posterior chest, which then delivers the fluid into the left subclavian vein near the heart. All right. Now, we can see the lymphatic system demonstrated here in this figure. Lymph nodes are... Lymph nodes are small bean-shaped structures along the lymphatic vessels. They contain a lymphatic channel as well as an artery and a vein. The lymph nodes, they provide a space for the cells of the immune system to be exposed to path uh, possible pathogens. Now, the lymphatic system, it serves many different purposes for the body by providing a secondary system of circulation. And so, again, it plays a lot of important roles. These include um, equal equalization of fluid distribution it includes transportation of biomolecules and it also includes immu uh, immunity so let's talk about these three things now equalization of fluid distribution is one purpose um, that the lymphatic system serves at the capillaries fluid leaves the bloodstream and it goes into the tissue and the quantity of fluid that leaves the tissue at the arterial end of the capillary bed really depends on both hydrostatic and oncotic pressure. So the Starling forces, we talked about this previously. Remember that the oncotic pressure of the blood draws water back into the vessel at the venule end once hydrostatic pressure has decreased. And because the net pressure drawing fluid in at the venule end is slightly less than the net pressure pushing fluid out of the arterial end, a small amount of fluid remains in the tissue. Lymphatic vessels, they drain these tissues and subsequently return the fluid to the bloodstream. So equalization of fluid distribution is one purpose that the lymphatic system um, holds. Another is transportation of biomolecules. The lymphatic system also transports fat from the digestive system into the bloodstream. Lacteals, small lymphatic vessels, they're located at the central of each villus in the small intestine. Fats that are packaged into chylomicrons by intestinal mucosal cells. They enter the lacteal for transport and lymphatic fluids carrying, um, they, they can carry many of these um, chylomicrons. They take on this milky white appearance um, that's called a chyle. All right, so transportation of biomolecules is another purpose that the lymphatic system holds. There's also immunity. As stated previously in this chapter, lymph nodes are a place for antigen-presenting cells and lymphocytes to interact. B cells proliferate and mature in the lymph nodes in collections called germinal centers. So it becomes obvious how the lymphatic system plays a role in immunity. All right. With that, we have completed the chapter. In the next video, we're going to tackle some practice problems together. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck. Happy studying and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.